The regular broadcast of the Minneapolis Committee of the Whole for February 8th, 2022 will now begin. Good afternoon. My name is Lene Palmasano and I'm the chair of the Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, February 8th. I'd like to note for the record, this meeting has remote participation by council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota state statute, open, Minnesota open meeting law section 13D.021 due to the declared state of local public health emergency. I will also note that the city is recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channels. This meeting is public and subject to Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Payne. Present. Council Member Wansley Warlaba. Present. Council Member Rainville. Present. Council Member Vita. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Osman. Here. Councilmember Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Present. Councilmember Chuktai. Present. Councilmember Kosky. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Vice Chair Chavez. Present. Chair Palmasano. Present. That's 13 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have three items on the agenda today. I think it will be fairly short. Um, and then in addition to our reports of committees that have met this cycle. The first item on our agenda is just an update to the appointment of council members to various boards, commissions, and committees. This is a continued effort from last time. We're working to be very intentional here about where we focus the council's time and energy. These are some additions that we have articles or bylaws for now or have confirmed with MnDOT that are projects still underway and important to have representation from the city. Uh, there is not a presentation for this item, but City Clerk Casey Carl is available for questions or comments. Is there any discussion? I will move approval of item one. Is there a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? The clerk will please call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chugtai. Aye. Councilmember Kosky. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. That's 13 yeas and zero nays. That carries and that item is approved. Item number two is a report on the contract awards or amendments that have been approved over the last couple of weeks by the ad hoc work group that were established for our ARPA expenditures, the American Rescue Plan Act related expenditures. Staff does not have a presentation for this item today, uh, but they are on hand if my colleagues have any questions. I will say that going forward in our new term, um, our CFO, Dushani Dai, will review and approve contracts based on procurement recommendation and all of the approved contracts that are were approved last year during the phase one ARPA cycle and considered and approved by council. Um, all of those contracts as they come in will be on our committee of the whole agenda monthly as receive and file. So um, 
you know, this is an expedited contract approval process that was implemented to get ARPA funding out the door as quickly as possible and into the hands of ways that it can do good. So these are phase one projects that were approved by the council and these contracts that we will um, have as a receive and file monthly at Committee of the Whole are simply executing on those already approved projects. Um, so let's see, is there any comments or discussion about this item? I'm not seeing any. So I will direct the clerk to file that report. Thank you. Our next agenda item is part of the government structure subcommittee. This subcommittee was established to receive reports on implementation of the executive mayor legislative council governance structure. And so I will invite Clerk Casey Carl to give us a presentation on that item. I think coordinator Heather Johnston might be part of it too. I'm not sure, but go ahead. I think I'm actually uh, kicking us off unless Casey wanted to, <laughs> wanted to anything to say. So I'm going to just Great. start by saying good afternoon, uh, Chair Paul Mazzano and members of the council. As you know, my name is Heather Johnston. I'm the interim city coordinator, and I'm here today with our city clerks, Casey Carl, to provide an initial presentation about the imp implementation of the executive mayor legislative council government structure, structure that our voters approved this past November. Uh, this is the first of what will likely be an ongoing series of presentations and discussions with the subcommittee as we work together to implement this new structure. There are a wide variety of issues that will need to be addressed over time. As you may be aware, the mayor has established an advisory work group to provide him with advice about how to organize the executive branch of the city, and that report is expected to be delivered within the next few weeks. Staff has also had a series of meetings over the past few months to evaluate the impact of this new structure and to identify questions about how this new structure will impact operations and internal reporting relationships. Today, we want to confine our focus to the high level relationship between the mayor and council and their roles and responsibilities. So the next slide will outline the topics that we plan to discuss. First, we'll address the timeline since the charter amendment was adopted. Second, we'll review the new governance structure, which is a system that shares power between an executive mayor and the new legislative council. That discussion will set the stage for a brief conversation about roles and responsibilities. Third, we'll identify some key issues, some questions and concerns that need to be addressed about this new governance structure in this new elective term and some of the new rules of the road, if you will, that we anticipate will need to be addressed to provide clarity and direction to the operating departments. Finally, we'll close with some recommendations on next steps. So the next slide shows the timeline. The, this past November, as you all know, voters adopted Charter Amendment number 184, which implemented a new governance model for the city of Minneapolis. It was typically uh, described as an executive mayor model. This amendment was initially developed by the Charter Commission. In its report, the commission said its primary goal was to clarify and consolidate responsibility for organizational performance in a chief executive, that being the mayor. Following the voter adoption, the amendment was effective one month later on December 3rd. That morning, Mayor Fry convened the department heads to communicate his goals and expectations of the city's administration, which encompasses all 20 operating departments. As of that date, the six, the, excuse me, the city's 10 charter departments now report directly to the mayor. The 10 management departments that support enterprise wide operations continue to be under the direction of the city coordinator. Two months after voter adoption, the mayor and council were sworn in to a new elective term. Obviously, it's been a busy couple of months. Following the election, the city had a lot to address, including the adoption of the 2020 22 budget, finishing all of the year in business and wrapping up the matters for the 2018 to 2021 City Council, transitioning, onboarding and orienting the new seven newly elected council members, planning for the swearing in and inauguration of the mayor and council, 
and of course organizing the city council for the for the how to conduct how you all will conduct your business including the election of the council's president vice president and the creation of all of the standing committees which you've already done among all that work city staff continued evaluating and planning for the implementation of the new governance structure we are just a little bit more than four months since the voters adopted the charter amendment so we wanted to highlight this timeline to level set and manage expectations as the one thing that we do know is it will definitely take time. And this, this managing this, these expectations are not just for the council, but for the community at large. Well, four months have passed since the election. It's been four months. And we are just now in the second cycle of regular committee meetings of the council. So we understand that there's a lot of work to be done and many challenges that we need to address. And we're, we are working hard, even though it's early in the term. At the staff level, we're still adjusting and adapting to this new structure and its impl implications for how we operate as a single enterprise under a system that separates the executive and legislative responsibilities. This presentation will identify some of the most pressing operational issues that staff have identified, which I believe will also align with some of the concerns that council members have raised during the last four weeks. As I said, we're early in the process and appreciate the invitation to address the subcommittee today so that we can move quickly to address any issues and challenges with implementing the new voter approved structure. So, so thank you again for the invitation to talk with you today. The next slide is the over the organizational uh, chart. Now you're going to know that Casey did these slides because it's very fancy. So I'm going to go through this next one here. The slide provides a visual representation of the operating structure. So under the charter amendment, the mayor becomes the chief executive officer of the city. So Click, there we go, um, and ensures a direct line of accountability to the entire community. In that capacity, the mayor serves in essentially three capacities as the political and policy leader of the city by partnering with the council to identify and articulate the city's goals and strategic priorities to enact local laws to govern the community and to adopt policies that regulate and direct the city enterprise in, deliveries, uh, in delivering city services and programs. Second, as the chief executive, day-to-day -day operations within the policy framework adapted by the council. And finally, the mayor function is, functions as the city's chief elected official and primary spokesperson and plays an important ceremonial role in the community and the city enterprise. enterprise excuse me. So as you can see in the green triangle, we're talking about the city council. As a counterbalance to the mayor, this council is a legislative and principal policy-making body of the council, of the city, excuse me, and oversees the new legislative department. The council will have all of the powers in the city government that aren't delegated or assigned to the mayor or other, another body or officer. Like other legislative bodies, the council is primarily concerned with three functions. First, in partnership with the mayor, it enacts local laws to govern the community and policies to regulate the enterprise. The council is vested under the state law with legislative po powers to enact local laws by ordinance and public policies that regulate the community. Second, am I freezing? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. You did there for, there for a couple seconds, couple seconds but it but seems that you're back. Okay. All right. Second, the council is responsible for maintaining an, a system of checks and balances within the system of government by monitoring, analyzing, and holding the administration accountable for its performance and providing policy level direction to ensure that the city is meeting the needs and priorities of the community. And finally, third, the council and its individual members provide a visible length to the community to ensure the voices of residents, neighborhoods, community stakeholders, and all partners are heard and incorporated into city decision-making on an ongoing basis. This final function includes what we call constituent services, which encompasses a wide range of responsive support and assistance by council members and their offices for their constituents and is an extension of their, their representative duties as elected officials. And finally, the third, the third piece is the city administration. Reporting to the mayor is, is a city administration, which is the collection of its operating departments shown here in orange. The operating departments are two in two different groups. The charter departments, which I mentioned earlier, are directly accountable to the mayor shown in the dotted box in this chart. I think you can kind of see that there. 
The heads of these departments are nominated by the mayor and appointed with the consent of the full council. These department heads, once appointed, serve at the pleasure of the mayor, mayor for terms that align with the mayor's elected term of office. The second group of management department heads right here are appointed by and responsible to the city coordinator. The heads of these departments are appointed by and serve at the pleasure of the city coordinator. So the next slide will show you a system of sh shared powers. As this slide shows, the new government structure is one in which the mayor and the council share power. Their official roles and responsibilities overlap, which is by design. We've highlighted the three major areas of overlapping power. Those include policy making, <clears throat> administration, and representation. It's often said that the executive proposes and the legislature disposes. This reflects the concept that in the realm of policy making, the executive is responsible for proposing policies that are then refined and enacted by the legislature. In terms of the city administration, the executive is responsible for directing operations and managing programs, while the legislature oversees and evaluates performance against stated goals. Finally, the executive is elected by and serves the entire community, while the legislative body is composed of members who represent smaller portions of the community. Casey Carl, our city clerk, will provide the next bit of detail about these overlapping powers. Uh, thank you to our city coordinator, Heather Johnston, and Madam Chair, members of the committee. We'll move forward now uh, with the rest of this presentation, talking about the system of shared powers that the Charter Amendment puts in place. As Ms. Johnston indicated, the new structure that was adopted by voters this past November is a system of shared powers. It shares power between the executive mayor and the legislative council. What I'm about to show you, the following slides, were taken from our recent orientation program for our newly elected council members. So much of this information will not be new, but the concepts that these slides reflect, I think will help us understand how municipal power is distributed and shared between the mayor and council. And in that regard, it is, I hope, instructive in terms of understanding the framework within which the city operates. So here to begin, we'll look at representation. The mayor and the council are elected but how these officials are chosen differs. And that difference is important because it reflects the very distinct and different but complementary functions that the mayor and the council represent. Very simply, they have and serve different constituencies. So their perspectives on how they approach governance is and should be different. The mayor is elected from a single district that encompasses the entire population of the city and is thus both its chief elected official as well as, under the new government structure, its chief executive officer. Uh, the mayor's district overlaps and contains all 13 wards, but that view is of the city as a composite of all of its parts. The mayor is accountable to the biggest voter base in the city, and by the nature of the office, the mayor then has certain independent powers that are delegated both under state law and city charter. Those powers are not dependent upon the council, but are separate and distinct from the council. In Minneapolis, unlike many other cities, the mayor is not a member of the legislative body. In raw political terms, it could be said that it takes seven council members to equal one mayor. In addition, because the mayor is a singular office, the incumbent has an advantage in terms of the centralized platform that the office provides. As the city's chief elected official, the mayor is the city's primary spokesperson, and it's of course easier for the public and the media to focus on the mayor than on a multi-member body of legislators. That's true for the president of the United States, it's true for governors at all 50 states, uh, it's true at the city level too. But because of that platform, the mayor has a number of other ceremonial responsibilities and is recognized as the head of the city for governmental and intergovernmental purposes, especially around emergency management and continuity of government functions. By Mr. contrast, Carl, yep. if I could just pause you there, um, we have a question or comment from Council President Jenkins, and I apologize it might not be from this slide, but from the end of Coordinator Johnson's presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Chair Parmesano. Uh, and and you are correct. It is from the initial or the last slide from Ms. Johnson's presentation. It's um, simply, and you may be getting to this, uh, Clerk Carl, but can you define um, dispose? So there's a, the saying that the executive proposes and the legislature disposes is the way of saying that the mayor has initiatory uh, responsibility. The council has to dispose or finalize and act on it. Um, so disposing so of it implement, simply means taking a vote. 
taking a vote, acting on it. Okay, all righty. Thank you. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I had a question also on this slide, this you know, idea of shared power and equals and our role as overseeing um, the executive function. And as we know, we have this unique circumstance around um, the police department, around our role of as overseeing. And I, I was hoping we could explore how does the police department stand apart from other departments now under this new structure? Or is our authority of oversight consistent across all departments under this new structure? Um, the police, I'll take that one. Madam Chair, is that okay? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Payne, um, the police department has under the charter reported directly to the mayor. Uh, now all of the charter department heads, thank you, um, report directly to the mayor. And so it's a more consistent, um, a consistent line of authority, if you will, under the new structure. If, if I may, um, the language of the um, police department being under the sole power and authority of the mayor still continues under this new structure. And that sole power and authority created a lot of barriers for direct action that council could take under the previous structure. Um, and I'm hearing that we are now creating a consistent uh, relationship between all charter departments and the mayor, but the language of the mayor having sole power and authority over the police department still remains in the current charter. And I'm just wondering, does that provide oversight restrictions on us as a body? Uh, Mr. Uh, or I'm sorry, Council Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Member Payne, I'm going to take a shot at this and I'm certainly going to invite um, our city clerk to expand on it if he would like to do so. Um, my answer to that is there will be um, many kind of charter amendments that you all will have to do to implement the new structure. And so um, I don't believe that, I, I believe that this does make some consistency, some consistency among all departments with respect to operations. And um, and so I think that uh, that sort of remains to be seen in terms of, I don't believe that that authority fundamentally changes, but I will stand to be corrected if the city clerk or others have different thoughts on that. Madam Chair, I would, I would um, only emphasize or point out that I think what Council Member Payne is saying in terms of the unique role of the police department and its direct reporting relationship to the mayor continues under the current uh, charter. It wasn't changed by this charter amendment in particular. Um, and as I've said previously, uh, while the mayor does have an exclusive authority to direct its operations, the council working in partnership with the mayor can uh, move forward with policies that affect the Minneapolis Police Department. Absent the mayor's concurrence, there is no opportunity for the council under the current structure to set policy for that one department. So it is unique and special in that regard. I do, however, uh, agree with the coordinator uh, in terms of the technical need to implement the voter approved form of government, the mayor and council together will have an opportunity to bring forward amendments both to the charter and to our code of ordinances. And through that implementation process, it is possible that many of these issues would be raised and could be addressed um, between both the mayor and council. And I know uh, council member Payne has already announced publicly his intent to bring forward an amendment to the charter. So that certainly does provide a platform for this specific conversation to move forward. Um, I would say that's separate, of course, from this conversation, but to your point, Councilmember Payne, yes, under the current charter as it exists, there is a separate relationship of the mayor with the police department. Thank you. I also just want to um, say to my colleagues, I don't know if everybody took a look at these slides last night or not, but most of these kinds of things will be addressed again further in the presentation. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for questions after as well. Madam Chair, if uh, if that's okay then with you, I'll proceed. We were on this slide here. 
Uh, I had finished discussing the powers of the mayor in terms of representing the city as a whole. The contrast to that, of course, is the role of the council, composed of 13 elected equal members, um, each of whom is chosen from a separate ward that has roughly equal population. Uh, based on our recent 2020 census, each ward contains approximately 33,000 residents. And that means that each council member is roughly responsible for being the elected representative of um, a ward that is roughly the size of Brooklyn Center. Uh, and yet no individual member of the council has more legal authority or power than any of the other members, not even the council president. The powers of the council president are only those which the body itself chooses to give to that individual member. The charter gives the council president only two functions. First, to be the first to take on the office of mayor and to serve in that capacity as a part of the line of succession, and also second to serve as a voting member of the Board of Estimate and Taxation. Ironically, the charter doesn't even require that the council president preside at meetings of council. All of those duties and functions of the council president are decided by the council through its rules. So the council is intended to be a body of equals. Under the city charter and under state law, Individual council members, however, have no power or authority. And yet, as a body, as Ms. Johnson was indicating, the council is vested with full legislative and policymaking authority for the entire city government. It is the council as a body which has that power. So here, when we're talking about re representation under our representational system, through which the voters choose the mayor and council, it provides for very localized representation by a council member who is elected from each ward, who has chosen to speak for and to advocate for the needs and priorities of their constituents in those unique communities and neighborhoods. That system of localized representation is then balanced by the mayor, who has chosen to speak for and advocate for overall for the broad-based needs and priorities of the entire city. So despite those differences in focus, all residents expect the mayor and council to work together to promote the long-term best interests of Minneapolis. And working together, the council and the mayor are expected to identify and to articulate the purpose of city government and its strategic goals. The next slide, we'll talk about policymaking. Here, policymaking processes take representation into the realm of government operations. It is the process through which public will is translated into actionable policies and programs. Here, the mayor has a more limited role, primarily stationed at the beginning and at the end of the process. At the beginning of the process, the mayor is able to propose and prioritize policies, primarily through the annual state of the city address and the budget, which the mayor develops and submits to finance city operations. At the other end of the policymaking process, the mayor has the authority to approve or to veto the official acts of the council, as well as the park board. The mayoral veto functions as an important check on council's policymaking authority, but it is not absolute. The council may, with a two thirds vote of its membership, override a veto and enact a local law or a public policy, notwithstanding the mayor's stated objections. And so once the council has adopted a policy, the charter requires that the mayor implement and enforce that policy. Clearly in the policymaking realm, council dominates. Proposals for new or amended policies can only be introduced by a council member. And that fact restricts the mayor's ability to unilaterally pursue preferred policies. The council sets its own agenda. So the mayor must collaborate with the council to achieve anything. Both sides have to collaborate to advance a shared agenda. And as we saw yesterday, the council also is the body which provides a public forum for decision-making processes through the conduct of its meetings and hearings and other formats. It is the council that provides space for public participation in community governance. And it is the council that holds final policy authority to regulate the operations of the city's administration. Next slide. One particular area of policymaking to focus on here is the budget and financial operation of the city. Here again, the mayor is responsible for initiating the process and implementing the final decisions made by council. The mayor develops the budget, which is the primary policy plan of the city that also identifies how it will pay for services and operations. The mayor receives input from all of the operating departments and gives direction to them in terms of prioritization uh, across the enterprise and then presents a comprehensive financial plan. 
The elected Board of Estimate and Taxation, on which the mayor serves as a voting member, is responsible for considering the mayor's proposed financial plan and setting the city's maximum property tax levy. In total, the property tax levy accounts for approximately 25% of the city's total budget, or about one quarter of all of the planned expenditures that's put forward in our spending plan. Once that maximum property tax levy is set by the Board of Estimate and Taxation, the proposed budget is submitted to the council. The council is then responsible for evaluating the mayor's financial plan, reviewing departmental requests, engaging the public in the process of deciding priorities and budgeting uh, allocations through a series of hearings. And ultimately, the council is responsible for refining, perfecting, and adopting the city's budget. After the budget is adopted, the mayor is responsible for its implementation and enforcement within the framework of financial policies adopted by the council. That's a very highly simplified uh, description of our budget process. In reality, what we refer to as the budget process and what people in the community know from a public perspective is the centerpiece of municipal policy, and it's a year-long event. Um, it's more than just a financing plan. It's also a statement of municipal policies, of agreed priorities, and programmatic details that underpin everything the city government hopes to achieve during a specific year. The budget process itself, as I've mentioned, consumes significant resources throughout the year, and it's best understood as a cycle, as depicted here on this slide. Significant internal review and planning takes place both prior to and throughout the budget process. A combination of internal and external reviews and evaluations feed into early decisions that shape the mayor's priorities and guidance to departments, and the department's own operational plans help to identify and prioritize service delivery. There is an ongoing negotiation and internal approval process for the expenditure of allocated funds, which can be addressed at either the operating level in departments, by departmental leaders, by the mayor, or even by the council, all as determined by applicable law and financial policies. Finally, there is, of course, the public process I've described, which involves the mayor's presentation of a proposed budget, the work of the Board of Estimate and Taxation to set the maximum tax levy, and then the work of the council to finalize and adopt the budget. And even as those final actions are being taken by council at the end of a year, the mayor and the executive team are already beginning their work on the budget process for the next year. So what we refer to that budget process is really the core of the city's policymaking process. The balance between mayor and council that's reflected in the budget process generally um, is also the same within policymaking processes. Uh, at certain points in the process, the mayor leads, at other times the council leads. But in the budget process and in policymaking more broadly, both of those partners are critical to success. And the people of Minneapolis, as I've said, expect both the mayor and the council to collaborate, to cooperate, and to compromise to achieve results on their behalf. Next slide. The final area of shared power uh, deals with the city's administration. As Ms. Johnson said, uh, this is the collection of the city's 20 operating departments. The Charter Amendment addressed this area more than any other uh, in terms of the shared powers between mayor and council. Prior to the amendment, the city's 10 charter departments reported simultaneously to the mayor and to the council. That situation often resulted in a lack of clear direction, confusion about whose direction was to be followed, especially in times of conflict, um, and it did create some waste or duplication of effort and delay in reaching decisions. The Charter Amendment separated and clearly delineated executive functions as the responsibility of the mayor, who then is the head of the administration and is accountable for its performance. Under the new structure, the council has the power to determine the organizational design and functions of the administration. It is the council that structures the administration and the mayor who manages it. The council is required to give its consent to the mayor's nomination of charter department heads and other administrative officials. The council also retains overall responsibility for the city's performance in all areas. And because of this final level of accountability that's vested in the council, the council then maintains a continuous review of the city enterprise performance. That oversight is even more critical today under this new government structure. And the charter did provide resources to assist the council in that regard with its oversight functions primarily through the elevation and expansion of the new reconstituted Office of the City Auditor. The Council then has full and final policymaking authority to regulate and direct the operations of the City Enterprise, and that enables the Council to set organizational priorities and to guide performance. The Mayor, 
as the chief election or chief executive officer has direct supervision and control over the administration. The mayor has the exclusive power to nominate the heads of the charter departments and administrative officials subject to the council's consent. Once those officers are confirmed by council, they operate under the mayor's direction and the mayor may discipline, suspend, or remove them with or without cause. These officials serve at the pleasure of the mayor during the mayor's elected term. And while the mayor must implement and enforce the laws and policies that the council adopts, the mayor does have executive discretion in determining some issues such as how, by whom, when, and where, and the manner in which those uh, matters adopted by council are implemented and then enforced. That level of discretion and the direct supervision and control over operating departments is the single most significant change that was made under the uh, government structure amendment. It means that the mayor is accountable for the performance of city government. And to borrow a phrase from Harry Truman, what it really means is that the buck stops at the mayor's desk. Next slide. So this slide then summarizes the overlapping and shared powers that both Ms. Johnston and I have described. Uh, here you can see that the executive mayor and legislative council share power, but those responsibilities while complementary, are separate. The council is the legislative and primary policy making authority of the city. As I've said, it has full authority uh, over the city's operations and has any residual power under state law that isn't delegated to the mayor or to another body. Um, the mayor is the executive officer and the city's chief elected official and is accountable to the people for the performance of the city government. Under the mayor's direction, the departments, called its administration, are responsible for delivering city services and programs and for managing daily operations. That would seem to be very clear, but as we know, in the real world, things are not always as easily defined and pulled apart as these slides would lead us to believe. So, as we've noted, the major changes under the new government structure impact the administration primarily. And this is where we observe and anticipate the majority of challenges that will come up as we implement the new structure. So in the next few slides, we'll look into those areas where we have experienced an immediate need for some clarification and direction. On this slide, uh, we've provided another representation of the city enterprise. Here you can see the city depicted as a three-dimensional triangle. On one side, you have the executive mayor. On the other side, the legislative council. The firm foundation here is the administration, those operating departments that actually deliver the city's services. And as we've stated, the mayor has then direct supervision and control over the administration. The mayor implements and enforces the policies that are adopted by council through those departments and is accountable for the performance of the city. The council has indirect control of the administration, primarily by setting citywide goals, adopting citywide policies that regulate and drive operations, and by evaluating city performance. I like to say that the council serves as the proxy of the people. And in this light, you could say that the council not only sets the policy framework for the city, but that it is also the primary customer of the administration. It, act, it sets both the service and operational expectations. It pays for service by adopting a budget and allocating funds between departments, and it determines the level of satisfaction with city performance. Thus, the council can exercise significant influence over departments, even though the council does not have direct supervision or control over those departments. On this next slide, we've tried to identify some specific responsibilities for the mayor and the council. I won't spend a lot of time reiterating the points we've already made. Again, though, I will emphasize it's the council that sets and determines the structure of the executive branch, that allocates functions amongst its departments, that sets and approves the budget and allocates funds. It is the mayor who has then the responsibility uh, to implement and enforce the policies that are adopted by the council, to appoint with the council's approval the department heads to manage operations, um, and to plan and organize the daily operations of the administration. So we'll move to the next slide. One thing that uh, I think should be clear now is that there's no exact bright shining division between what is the policy making role of the council, what is the policy implementing role of the mayor. Um, it'd be nice if there were a very clear line and that we could say in every instance, this is executive or that's legislative. The fact of, uh, of the matter is that there is no such model. There's no way for us to provide that model. Rather than a very clear, straight dividing line, you can see here what's depicted is a curved, broken line that crosses over four major functional areas across the enterprise. And that's because, as we've said, 
it's much more of a dance between the executive and the legislative and not a pure division or competition. At the highest level, at the mission level, the governing body, which includes the council and the mayor working together in collaboration, is responsible for determining the city's purpose, its mission. At this level, the governing body is focused on addressing questions about why the city exists, what the city is supposed to accomplish, and who benefits or who the benefactors of its services are. And this can change from one situation to the next or based on certain context. This work is about setting the course of the city and providing the overall long range vision for the city's future. This work obviously bleeds into the area of policymaking, where mission, values, and goals are more defined and specific outcomes or results are identified. At this stage, the city's executive team, which is my name for the uh, department heads uh, who head up each of those departments, are involved in helping the governing body to identify specific policymaking priorities. Um, they come in to help inform and to influence choices about enterprise policies and priorities. Still, even here at the level of policy, it's dominated by the council and by the mayor. Once those policies are set, it becomes the chief responsibility of the mayor to implement and enforce the policies. And that's the area identified in green here as administration. And then under that box, you'll see the orange box management. That's primarily where the department leaders and their management teams then take on responsibility for daily operations and the delivery of the city's services and programs. We'll move to the next slide. So this slide is going to have several moving parts. It shows exactly what I just showed, but in a little bit different format. It's showing you sort of an overlapping or interlocking series of how policy operates from the broadest level at the governing body, which again is the mayor and the council together, uh, down to the lowest level. So here at the governing body level, you can see um, focus activities are around setting city goals, defining strategic priorities, enacting local laws, and setting and adopting enterprise-wide policies. Um, the next level uh, is really that which shown in orange. And this is really where the mayor and the administration focus on operating plans at the departmental level, how they're going to deliver their services, performance management, uh, the administration policies that provide consistency in terms of how we use the city's resources, and then also enterprise-wide processes and controls. At this level, we're thinking about long-range planning and direction. We're talking about service planning and organization. And then in the most narrow context in green, you have departmental policies and operations. This is about standard operating procedures, monitoring performance and making reports. This includes guidelines and best practices, um, it's day-to-day -day operations, service delivery, uh, and primarily this is where employees, teams, and department divisions are doing their work day by day. So we'll move forward in another uh, slide uh, just to show in a linear fashion what it would look like in a perfect top-down world uh, if these things were done. If you could announce this, uh, advance the slide to the tech team. Here you can see policies, procedures, performance. Again, in a perfect world, it would flow like that and there wouldn't be uh, the mishmash or the dividing line between all four of those functional areas I showed on a previous slide. But the concept here is still the same. At the highest level, the council, the mayor together as a governing body are going to determine direction, set strategic goals and determine how the city uh, operates. The mayor working with department leaders, handling uh, procedures, implementation and enforcement through administration, and then the frontline departments providing management over the day-to-day -day operations and service delivery. In theory, that's how the ideal system works. We recognize, of course, that no ideal system exists and that no theoretical construct would necessarily survive uh, the complexities of the reality of governing today. Uh, we know, for example, that systems are flat and are increasingly open. Change is constant and adaptability is an absolute necessity. Information, whether credible or not, is ubiquitous, and everyone has almost instant access to more data than ever before, even if it lacks context, even if it's inaccurate. And so there is a constant struggle for the city to identify, verify, and amplify data. Power is shared, and it's overlapping between levels of government from federal, state, regional, and local, including the city, between elected officials, and especially between public and private sectors, and most importantly, with the people we all serve, regardless of where we're at in that larger structure. 
And then of course we know that the public demand for greater levels of access and participation has never been higher. Um, and the need for government accountability has never been greater. So given all of these realities, as we implement this voter approved government structure, what's most critical from our perspective right now, especially at the beginning, is clarity. And to that end, staff has identified some areas that we think are the most critical for achieving that clarity, uh, as she noted at the beginning, between the mayor and the council and between the mayor and the council and the operating departments. So I'll turn it back over to Ms. Johnston to highlight sort of those final concluding thoughts on clarity and where we go from here. Madam Chair, I won't uh, read these questions to you, but as you as indicated earlier, and we've communicated in several different ways, um, there have been a number of different uh, efforts underway uh, to try and find some common ground here in terms of understanding the shared uh, concerns and issues. Department heads have convened several times. The mayor, mayor convened a work group to explore um, several functions uh, to figure out how the city can be most effective, efficient, and equitable. From these efforts and our experiences over the past few weeks since the term began, we've identified a, a need for clarity in a few issues. These are shown on the screen. We think that the clarity about the formal roles and responsibilities is important in defining and building a shared understanding about formal touch points for interaction between the Legislative Council and the Executive Mayor. We, we're not going here to propose solutions today, but have ideas, and we respect that the Mayor and Council members must, must also hear, have ideas on this point. And that's why we're here today to hear your ideas as well. We simply respectfully to believe that clear direction on these issues needed to be made and communicated to departments. Equally important, we need a clear understanding on how the council can interact with the administration and how these interactions are handled. The new government structure prohibits the council from interfering with the mayor's direction of the administration. And the administration, however, the con administration continues to support the council's legitimate functions with respect to policy making oversight and representation. We will continue to work together as a city. This is reflected in the second and third points on the slide, but all of it points to the need for clear direction about how we interact with one another, how we can support the council, which is required in the charter. One thing that has not changed under the new governance structure is that departments will always continue to provide the subject matter expertise that is necessary to inform, develop, implement and enforce council policies. So we need to develop a shared understanding among the council member, the council, mayor and executive team about how those systems and procedures and interactions are to be managed. The mayor and I have already began conversations about these issues and we've had many conversations with the department heads. We've talked with the city clerk and the city attorney in terms of brainstorming efforts. We've also shared some initial proposals with council leadership. The work will, this work needs to continue, but likely we will need to expedite this work in several areas that where we need more immediate direction. All this work is about clarity, organizational design and shared understanding about roles and responsibilities. All of those clarity is needed to ensure the resources and systems in, that are in place to ensure an effective partnership between the administration, the mayor and the council. These are much bigger conversations and will likely be the focus of ongoing discussions over the next few years. So in terms of looking at clear and consistent direction, we have a, a slide of rules of the road. Um, on behalf of the executive team of department leaders, we would like to consider the mayor, or we would like the council to consider a shared directive to create some rules of the road. This would be a shared agreement about providing clear, consistent direction to the enterprise. What the departments see is necessary right now are a system to receive, prioritize, manage and process requests from the council and its committees, as well as individual council members with respect to the official and legitimate functions of the council, along with a shared understanding of timeliness, accuracy and responsiveness to those requests. A consistent and transparent method for council members to bring forward policy proposals to the relevant Departments and staff with subject matter expertise can be engaged to contribute to the work of the developing city policy. We've already begun that in several cases. An integrated enterprise constituent service system with associated processes that will ensure timely and accurate responses to information. Finally, regular reports with enterprise performance known as emerging issues as well as time updated timely, excuse me, timely updates on major projects and initiatives. 
We don't have exact proposals on any of these, but we'll like to um, make sure that we have identified the proper needs of the council as well as other as well as the mayor. Uh, we want to work together with you to develop solutions to these needs. And finally, for next steps, Madam Chair, we'd like to outline a couple of next steps. Next slide. So subject to the approval of the mayor and council leadership, we have the city. I will work with the city clerk um, to develop with input from all departments an outline of different ways that we can address the points for the last line. Specifically, we'll look at providing clarity and direction about roles and responsibility of mayor and council with respect to day-to-day -day operations of the city administration. We'd also like to provide clear guidance and expectations for the city administration on how to engage with and support the council with its official legislative policy making oversight and representational functions. The, the final draft of this guidance would be brought back to the body for review. Staff would expect to have an initial draft circulated very soon and hopefully approved in the next few weeks with the goal of having something finalized and approved by the council and mayor in early March. Um, as thank you very much, Madam Chair, this is the end of our, our presentation. We're happy to respond to any questions. And one other thing I would just mention is that we are continuing to learn from each other as we go forward in this process. Um, we're going to ask for your continued patience um, as we make mistakes and we've already modified our direction um, with departments uh, as we've uncovered certain areas where the initial approach wasn't working. And so we want to thank you for making for being open with us about um, where we have challenges and being patient with us for um, as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have at least one council member in queue for discussion, but I will first just move approval of the staff directive that is um, before you that staff themselves on this last slide has proposed um, and we'll move into discussion. Um, council member Rainville. Uh, thank you. Uh, Lene, I appreciate uh, the opportunity here. I just have an overall question. I understand that uh, the department has due to uh, report directly to the mayor and I understand we are not to interfere in their work, but we're going to need their help and expertise as we develop our policies. So I, I wonder if you could just give me a brief snapshot of what you think that will look like. And this is to uh, uh, either you, Casey or, or Heather. I'm going to defer to Ms. Johnson as, as a starting point and happy to add on to whatever she says. Uh, thank you, uh, Casey. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Rainville, um, what that looks like to us is as the council is making decisions to move forward and um, evaluate certain policy proposals, we would continue to work with um, with council to provide expertise. We'll come and testify as we do now to provide information um, and do research and things to make sure that we're giving the council a broad understanding of the pluses and minuses of their po policy considerations. So very similar to what we would do now. Um, I'll stop there and see if uh, Mr. Carl has anything to add. Thank you. I would only add to that uh, what some of you are aware of. I know that uh, Council Vice President Palmasano, Council Member Ellison, and his prior uh, service in the last term as the chair of the Rules and Elections Committee and even President Jenkins uh, were involved in an effort that due to many, many extraordinary circumstances got sort of tabled for a while. And that was a a look at the city council itself and its legislative process and how we could make our own improvements. And I think through uh, a little bit more formalization and standardization to that structure and that process, we can actually provide um, a more complete avenue for how individual council members can engage with departments to elicit their uh, feedback, their expertise, and their engagement in the work of the council in developing policy proposals uh, that ultimately, of course, would be introduced through the committee system and finally adopted by council. So I think there are things that the administration does on its side uh, in terms of how to connect with us. I think there are things we can do on the legislative side to proactively uh, build out those systems and resources for how we connect to the administration for our functions as well. So I think it's a two-tiered approach. Uh, so thank you. Do, do you have a rough timeline? Is this a couple weeks, a couple months? When, when can we expect some movement back to us on that? 
I think Ms. Johnston mentioned that we are looking to continue working with the mayor and council leadership, which uh, I'm pleased to share has, has started this term uh, and is very effective, I believe, in terms of gathering in one place that high level policy direction. Uh, we've worked with them and I think that we would be able to, with their direction, bring back some proposals and outlines on those systems and structures and resources uh, as I think Ms. Johnson said, by early March. So uh, mid-March at the latest, we're almost there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Chair. This question is for Mr. Call. Um, Mr. Call, as you know, one area we've experienced some immediate challenge in is serving our constituents. So um, I'm wondering, if, uh, I mean, I know we've had some preliminary discussions about this, about those concerns, but I'm wondering if you could give us some high level plans on how to address those concerns. Thank you. Um, to the Council Vice President and specifically Council Member Vita, uh, yes, we are aware that there have been some challenges with how the organization supports Council in terms of its constituent service functions and representational duties. Um, we are doing our best in juggling a myriad of priorities and needs right now, but I am happy to tell you that Ms. Johnson and I have convened a very small working group. Uh, primarily, it's those departments that have the most public facing functions. Um, so for example, city communications, neighborhood and community relations, our service desk center and 311. Those are primary intake points with the city through all of our audiences and constituents. And we've begun the process of talking about how do we um, more formalize and systemize our reports and structures and systems together. Um, we're meeting on a regular basis and we're coming up with a series of recommendations that ultimately would feed up to you in terms of this is how we think the administration and legislative branch can work together to support individual council members and ward offices in serving your constituents in a very timely manner um, and still being able to provide accurate uh, support for the work that you're doing. Do you have any follow-ups, council member? Oh no, thank you, Mr. Call. Thank you. All right. Um, the next in queue is council member Ellison. And I do just want to say that I heard his voice on the way into work this morning on the radio. Um, there is no, I think, um, better model of showing how we can have a civil conversation um, and move forward together in partnership between council and mayor. We have our whole local government structure operating um, in dialogue than what we saw yesterday at your committee. Um, and I just want to say I was kind of dismayed at how your a question to you was teed up saying that the council powers were greatly diminished after the last election. That's you, I think you you pushed back a little bit, but you know, I see great strategic opportunity to be a stronger council out of this and really make important structural changes here as we get into the new government structure. So with that, Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Council Vice President and um, Yes, that's the perception, but we're we're shaping what what this looks like now. So I want to thank the clerk um, and Heather Johnston for this work. Um, you know, one question that I had um, was under um, there was a portion that kind of spelled out some of our uh, roles and responsibilities, and it talked about how enforcement of policy uh, would fall under the mayor's purview, which makes a lot of sense. You know, thinking about how we're shaping up here, uh, but I did want to. Uh, ask a question about um, um, how the council could act if we felt like something wasn't being enforced, a policy that we passed wasn't being enforced, um, or, or is that more or less the prerogative of the mayor? Uh, for So for example, you know, we uh, worked last term to pass the renter first policy, uh, which sort of changes the ways that we engage with renters and um, uh, housing inspections, um, increases the number of TRAs that we engage in, if we had an administration that didn't value that, uh, could could the could the enforcement of that policy simply not be um, uh, not be done? Madam Chair, um, 
if I can, I, I would like to take a, a stab here at the start. And I know that Ms. Johnston, based on her experience, especially in a, although a separate system, a city manager system, can talk about the um, powers of council to still hold ultimate responsibility. I would start by saying in our system, another word to put in, and I, I don't know if this is on that slide, but I think you're talking about slide 14 for the tech team, where we're talking about shared powers with administration. Um, yes, the mayor is authorized under the charter for in implementation and enforcement of policies set by council. What council then has is that last bullet there. First, start with adopt goals, plans, and pri policies, right? That's what you were saying. Renter first policy. That's the council's uh, priority. It's a policy we've adopted. The mayor and the departments working together have to implement and enforce that policy. Council, especially with the elevation and expansion of the role of the city auditor, has another word we should add, evaluation, right? The mayor has to implement and enforce with the support of the expanded city auditor's function. You all then hold the mayor and through the mayor, the entire administration accountable through evaluation. And so by setting the uh, annual work plan of the auditor and giving assignments to the auditor, that's I think the, the final piece of that that maybe I didn't underscore enough. I hope that addresses that question. Um, the evaluatory and final performance management functions are always vested in the legislative body here at the council. But that's my answer. Uh, would turn to Ms. Johnston for another perspective. That's super helpful. And um, Ms. Johnston, please add if you do have any, and I wanna clarify, um, I think that the work of the renter first policy is going along fine. I plucked it out as a random example, <laughs> um, but uh, but yes, I'll uh, I'll let you go, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, Councilmember Ellison, um, I would just just add to that that once the council passes changes to ordinance, that becomes the law of the city, and we as staff are responsible for implementing the law of the city and upholding the law of the city. And um, it may may sound overly simplified, but to me it is a little bit simple in that regard. So I don't know if that's helpful, but um, we would expect that if you don't believe that we're doing that, um, that you're going to call us in front of your committees and uh, talk to us about how, you know, whether it's a resource issue, whether it's a lack of clarity in terms of direction, um, but we would have we would expect that we will have that conversation. That's very helpful. Thank you both. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I actually am um, going to just reiterate. So thank you, um, Council Member Ellison, for um, for that question. And and I will also reiterate the aforementioned uh, compliments on yesterday's meeting. Um, it was a really uh, positive moment, I think, for the city to to really begin to look at um, what we can do to help um, disrupt this continuous cycle. Um, but I, I want to just emphasize, um, and I know it's been mentioned, alluded to, but uh, some some level of regular reporting um, so that we are hearing from departments on a regular basis beyond just the budgetary uh, hearings. Um, and specifically, I mean, there have been other reasons. I mean, Council Member Ellison lifted up performance, um, but also um, we we have to make budgetary decisions based on uh and that is that is our ultimate authority i believe in this process um and so uh want to ensure that there is that level of uh, regular reporting and we have to have that from the police department as well um so that has got to become a part if, if this is parity if this is level setting with all of the other departments, then subsequently we need to be hearing from the police department in a public safety hearing, uh, in a um, committee of the whole, in a POGO committee, wherever that level of discourse can happen. But, and I think it's most appropriate in a public safety 
committee, uh, PHS committee, um, but to have those regular kinds of touch points and touchstones uh, for the council to understand what what is happening in these um, committees. And then I wanted to ask if um, if we can get a little more um, clarity and understanding around the reconstituted, reinvigorated audit committee. And, um, and then just highlight the importance of codifying whatever the new structure becomes. So we're not operating kind of under a, this is how it has always been done, et cetera, et cetera but with a, 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 a codified way of, of really understanding how that work is done. And I recognize this work is going to be um, uh, extensive and it's gonna take time for us to get to these levels, but, but those need to be the goals that we are um, headed towards in my mind. So I'll, I'll, I'll listen for um, the audit committee kind of update um, and if anybody wants to address any of the other points I brought up as well. Madam Vice President, to President Jenkins point, I, I just want to reiterate what I heard in your comments, three specific points that I think you're asking for feedback on. One, you discussed um, and emphasized an important point about the council's need for regular reporting um, across a broad range of subject matters, not just limited to, but certainly including anything that has an impact on budget um, and financial policies, which are the purview of the council as one topic. I would refer that to our coordinator, Heather Johnston. I know she has topics to address there. Two, the um, new and reconstituted role of the audit committee as an independent body and through it, the city auditor. I'll try and tackle some of those, but I know I can also call on uh, Council Vice President um, uh, Palmasano. We had the first audit committee yesterday and talked about this and I'll try and start that conversation. Um, you made a final comment. I'm not sure that there's something I can respond to on needing new codified ways forward other than just to say that I believe I can speak for Ms. Johnson and I both to say that we concur and that was our hope to get out of this conversation is direction to bring forward some of those recommendations and best practices for how we can codify that. So if I captured those three points, I'll first turn to Ms. Johnston on the issue of regular reporting to council. Uh, yeah, those were absolutely my three points. You captured it very accurately, thank you. Madam Chair, Council President Jenkins, um, I, I concur with what um, our city clerk just said. We'd like to both formally and informally um, communicate with council so that you have, um, one of the things you'll hear me say is we would like to be a lot more proactive. Um, I feel like we spend a lot of time of our time here in the city being reactive. Um, our preference would be to move that to a proactive um, means of communication so that you have both general sort of citywide information as well as information that might be of interest to your constituents. Um, and that we would do that if, like pr proactively on a regular basis. So that um, we don't have a formal proposal today, as I said, but that's our intent. Um, and then also agree in terms of regular reporting to the, the council committees and we have to figure out what that looks like. So thank you for the question. And if I may just add, um, yesterday at our first audit committee meeting of the term, um, we gave direction because it would most appropriately come from audit committee to our current internal auditor to ask for best practices and advice about the structure of the future independent audit committee and what that would look like and how we might structure it um, and other kinds of recommendations coming from him. So we plan to hear about that even at our next audit committee meetings, which would be in March. So from a timing perspective, I feel like there's a lot of moving pieces, um, but we're getting all of the recommendations from the right places here for all of our consideration as to how we move forward um, as soon as possible. We're, it's like we're setting up a whole new government here, it almost feels like. Um, so it is complex, but I think it's moving pretty well. 
So, Madam Chair, if I may, um, you know, I, I think at the onset of this presentation, which um, thank you to to staff, to the clerk's office, to the city coordinator's office, and, and all of the department heads that have been engaged in this work up to this point, including the mayor's um, um, committee uh, that's comprised of um, volunteers and, and people who really uh, care about the city of Minneapolis in my mind. So, so thank you um, to those to, to all of those folks for this presentation. Um, but, you know, I, I just wanted to, um, to sort of highlight, I guess, um, you know, a point that the city coordinator brought up, you know, if, if we don't feel like we can, can, we are getting satisfactory, we can, you know, call people in front of our committees, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of feels like that's not, that's being eliminated from this process. So that's why I'm really pushing for a, um, like a regular reporting schedule. And, and that said, um, we, can, we can continue to move on. I think people agree, are in, in agreement with that and codification, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, and I, I do, I guess the point I was trying to make, and, and maybe I lost it momentarily, but this is, this term, this two year term is really going to be about building our government for the future. And so, you know, in the kind of opening remarks by uh, Ms. Johnson of level setting, like we are going to have some some gaps in our understanding, some um, maybe disagreements in interpretations, um, and so um, you know I'm I'm really seeing this as a a, a term where we are um, restructuring our government as we govern. And that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, not to even mention, um, but I will as it's, as a way to emphasize what um, Council Member Payne um, brought up early on in this presentation is that what these first few weeks of our term um, have brought us to endure um, really has us focused a lot about how do we move forward with um, what kind of oversight do we have as a legislative body um, over policing in our city. And I know that will be a continued discussion. Um, Council Member Chavez. Chair Promosano, Mr. Clerk, thank you so much for walking us through this presentation. It's been helpful, at least for me to hear about the process and appreciate everyone's work that has gone on to, on to this. My only question is that since we're the legislative body, just wondering how the city council, uh, I know the council leadership, our council president and council vice president have been involved in this process, but I'm just wondering what ways can us as a legislative body, the entire city council get involved in this process? If you can name some points where we can collaborate. And the reason I say that is because I don't wanna see a process where the city council, the, the legislative body is giving consent at the top or end of this process. And just wanna make sure that we're being fully involved in this. Uh, to the council vice president, council member Chavez, I can say as your clerk, who is a direct report to the body, um, one of my next steps having talked to the council leadership is I need to get in front of all of you. Um, my partner and peer, Ms. Johnston, representing the administration, uh, and I will be, uh, you know, working to get information, um, provide clarity in response to very specific questions you might have, and then incorporate any uh, direction you have 
We want to do that as quickly as possible, obviously, because as I think Ms. Johnson emphasized, the need here across the enterprise is for clarity, not just between the mayor and the council, but between the council and the departments and even with the departments to both the mayor and the council. And so um, although we will be moving very quickly, um, we are going to try and incorporate all of that feedback. I would also venture to guess that Ms. Johnson will echo this comment, and that is this is a starting point and these sort of rules of engagement and codified procedures about how we work together as an enterprise will be changing and modifying as we experience them. Council President uh, used an analogy to say, we're building the city government as we're operating the city government. Um, and that's very true. And so uh, while we do anticipate that these initial rules of the road will help provide clarity and direction to everyone, we also recognize that they will change over time as needed. So that's a first answer to your question about how you all individually engage. Um, call on Ms. Johnston for her uh, additional comments on that point. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member Chavez, um, I would just say this is this is the first piece of it, but I would even say it's happened before then. Um, you all should continue to call and raise your concerns um, to both the clerk and myself. Um, and whether it's email or calling, I think um, Council Member Vita's question, um, we, we had some pretty rough pain points associated with the first couple weeks, um, and we tried to work to address those immediately. Um, they're not fixed. It's not 100% fixed, I'll tell you that. Um, but it's really helped us sort of refine our focus on, um, you know, making that constituent relations piece a priority, for example. Um, and really, really trying to, we, we want to take in the information from you all during this presentation, but if you um, absolutely let us know, if you're thinking about this tonight at three o'clock in the morning and want to shoot me an email, please do. Maybe don't call, but um, shoot me an email if you come in the middle of the night. But, um, but really, like, what, what we want this to be is a continued conversation. This is going to be the first time that we're in front of you talking about this. This will not be the last time. You all will be um, tired of us by the time we get everything ready to be implemented. So I will just say that to you. So thank you for the question. Awesome. And if, I may, if I may also add, um, for now, we don't have, <laughs> Council Member Chavez, you're my vice chair. Um, what we have potentially teed up for the next committee of the whole might be, um, just make might be um, hearing back from that government structure committee about what their report is so that we can hear directly the feedback of that body um, and not just wait necessarily to hear what um, what proposal comes to us from the mayor's office on that um, but also you know in general I think we've all been communicating we're all here at City Hall a lot and I know that people have been giving me pretty continuous feedback as to how things have been going. I'm sure they've been communicating to our council president as well. So as a thought, um, we might want to do another presentation, even next committee cycle here on this. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Council member Goodman. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and um, Mr. Carl and Ms. Johnston, I have just a couple of thoughts, really not as much questions. Um, this is a very unique moment in time, and it is way beyond any of us as individuals. Uh, it's about creating a system that will last for hopefully another hundred years. I'm really grateful for the work that has happened so far, uh, but ultimately it is literally like turning the Titanic, and we are in the second cycle. <laughs> of this two-year term and so the fact that this is even coming before us is probably quicker than I would have thought. Um, Councilmember Ellison said something interesting that I wanted to pick up on which is um, our policy direction is pretty much going to be very similar to what it was before um, but the oversight piece of it is actually new and I think that that's an opportunity and I want to point out that um, we can use our budget process in order to ensure oversight. A good example would be um, if the mayor didn't put into his budget enough people to handle enforcing tenant protections, we would add to that. I don't think that at that point we the administration would say, well, we're not going to spend the money because we don't agree. 
the mayor would have to veto the budget in order to say that's something that we're not doing. So I do think that the oversight tool is a large tool and we just have to figure out how we're going to use it, both through our budget process and our policymaking process. I was reflecting yesterday with Ms. Johnston about why I am so anxious about this constituent service problem. And I view it as a large problem. And she doesn't view it as as big of a problem as I do, I don't think. And that's because old council members in terms of tenure, like me, have spent careers solving constituent problems. But new council members, and there's a majority of you, don't even know how to do that yet. So a new system will be easier for you to adapt to than for someone like me, who has always known to do things a certain way. And so I probably will have to take a bit of a step back in understanding that it won't be the way I did it before, but it hopefully will be effective. I will point out so far, it has not been. There are some simple things like my street's not plowed, call 311. Our, um, there's graffiti on this wall, call 311, and everyone equitably gets in line. But there are all sorts of other issues that constituents call our office about that cannot be handled through 311. Uh, some examples of that might be a dangerous dog, um, some level of animal control type issue, zoning variances, land use approvals. We can't just have people calling 311 to solve those problems. And we need to know as council members that when people call 311, the call is answered in a timely manner. And that means like within 10 or 15 seconds, not 20 minutes. And we need to know that when someone calls 311 and they get a case number, we need to be able to look up that case number and understand if that problem has been solved. Because often the constituent doesn't view it as solved. A good example of that would be there are 635 streetlights in the city of Minneapolis that are currently out. Street lighting is an alternative public safety measure. And in the part of the ward that I represent, Loring Heights, along with Councilmember Osman, Stephen Square, the lights have been out for the better part of three years. So calling 311 is not going to solve that problem figuring out how to get petitions signed in order to put in a new lighting system that will happen through some sort of assessment is much more complicated than calling 311. Yet people are frustrated that they call 311 to report a light and nothing happens with it. And then you can take it to the policy level. We asked if we should put more money in the budget to fix street lights faster. We were told it would get resolved and still here we are after the budget was even more than 635 street lights out. So we need to address these constituent problems as the core function of what we do in the city's business. And I'd like to remind us all, I don't need this reminder, nothing will happen without the council's vote of approval. Let me repeat that. The mayor will not be able to on his own, nor will the department heads be able to on their own create a structure that we will be living with without a vote of the council because charter amendments will likely need to happen in order to make those changes. So we have an incredible amount of responsibility, some might call it power, in order to participate in a system that works for everyone. And for someone like me who's used to doing things the way I have been, I stipulate to the fact I might not be able to do it that way, but I would challenge us all to do it better maybe than I've done it in the past. And so in the end, I'm impressed with the uh, quickness of this work. I appreciate the fact that we're getting this briefing in a very timely manner. I would encourage us to work with each other to understand what an acceptable service level for constituent response is. We should talk to each other about that and try to figure out if we think it's okay that no one gets a call back or 311 doesn't answer and challenge the administration to do that better. I don't get any comfort out of saying, I'm not in charge of this call the mayor. Your streetlight didn't get fixed, blame him. I don't think that that's a comforting thing to constituents. I think they expect us to come down and solve problems. I want to do my part. I know that all of the council members do want to do their part. And so I just wanted to offer those thoughts this is a very unique moment we're in, my colleagues. Let's join together to make it something really fantastic that will last another 100 years. Thank you.
Thank you. Council Member Koski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and for Carl and Ms. Johnston. Um, and thank you, Council Member Goodman for your transparency and for your um, just being open and honest with us because yes, as somebody who has been uh, around this city for a long time, um, I, I'm, I appreciate you being open about um, your feelings around this. So, um, but yeah, I really appreciate this report and I agree that you know clarity is gonna be very important as we look to implement the new structure. Uh, and I'm wondering, Ms. Johnson, if you could tell us What's uh, one thing or a couple things that we could do as the councils that would be the most supportive uh, as departments are working on adapting to this new structure? I mean, I, the, some of us as council members are adapting um, and I imagine that this is quite a change for many department heads as well and those that are um, um, have been in the city for a long time. Madam Chair, Council Member Koski, thank you for your question. Um, and it, it actually ties ties well with some of the comments that Council Member Goodman um, made as well. Um, let me first say that I do believe that the constituent relations are an incredibly important piece of the puzzle here as we make this transition. Um, we're in the process of training up new 311 operators. We we do think that we need to you know get some of those things taken care of as soon as possible and it may um, make for a conversation about resources eventually. To your specific question, Council Member Koski, um, I, be, please be patient with us. We are really trying to um, clarify. We've asked uh, Council Members to address their um, questions and concerns to department heads so we can allocate or kind of address those. We know that at some point that's going to be, we're going to have kind of key people in our departments that are going to be responsible for handling some, handling some of these things, especially things like constituent calls. Um, we have some departments who handle those things already or have individuals. Um, the police department was mentioned earlier we know that you're going to have conversations with the inspectors in the precinct that absolutely in the precincts that absolutely makes sense. Um, and so um, really appreciate uh, your willingness to continue to um, tell us where the pain points are um, to ask questions about what makes sense and to give us your thoughts about what um, what is really going to be helpful as we move forward. Uh, we are going to have some very specific requests here in the next hopefully month or so um, about to get your reactions to some more proactive communications that we'd like to do too. So um, my specific request is for patience, continued patience, thank you. Um, and you know, just to, to continue to share our, your thoughts with us as we move forward in this process. So thank you for the question. Thank you, uh, Ms. Johnson. And one, one other question, um, you know, kind of rolling off of Councilmember Goodman and just how transparent and honest she was, um, you know, what are you hearing from department heads uh, around these changes too? Because like I said, I imagine that this is, um, this is a lot of change for them as well. Yeah, I think the, um, overall, I would say department heads are um, looking forward to having a little bit more clarity with respect to communication and direction. Um, I think that I, I, I think over the last six months, I've heard a lot about how challenging it was and having worked in this structure for a number of years previously, how challenging it is um, to try and figure out what is the, the number, my one number one priority. Um, and it makes it a difficult to do work efficiently and do it well um, when you're kind of moving in one direction or another. And so I think department heads are anxious and excited about the change um, to have clarity of direction. Uh, and really want it, they want to do it right. If there's one thing I can tell you about our department heads is they are very passionate about serving the city um, and they're passionate about doing a good job serving the city. And I think um, they, generally speaking, have been giving feedback that um, these changes will really help them do better. Um, I think it was Council Member Goodman's point is we really do want to provide services better. Um, and in a more efficient manner. And we also want to ensure that there's equity in the delivery of services throughout the, the city as well. So um, those are those are some of the pieces of feedback that we've heard. 
um, from department heads. Um, they feel it'll be a little bit easier for them to direct the work and prioritize. And as we get data, hopefully we can get more data from 311 as we get that staffed up appropriately and are able to start allocating resources so we can get some of these longstanding issues taken care of as well. So thanks for the question. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your thorough answers and I am really excited to be part of this process. As President Jenkins said, you know, we are we are making history here. We are building our government structure for our future. And that's really exciting that we as a council get to collaborate with all of you to do this. Thank you. And uh, also in queue, Council President Jenkins. No, I am I'm, I'm done with my comments. Thank you. Um, oh. I will just echo what uh, Council Member Goodman shared. Great. Council Member Chuck Tai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and want to echo the appreciation for um, our, our clerk and our coordinator around um, putting this together and uh, presenting us with with this um, recommended direction. Um, you know, I think I heard this earlier uh, in one of the questions someone else asked, but just want to clarify um, in one of the earlier slides, there was that that delineation of propose and, and dispose. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm trying to just make sure I'm understanding this correctly the primary responsibility of, of the legislative body, the city council is to, you know, write our city's uh, laws. And um, and so I'm, I'm trying to understand the piece on, on the mayor's responsibility being proposing. And that, is that like, uh, to, or I guess to put it more plainly, what I'm wondering is do, do we have to wait for the executive to come to us with a proposal in order to act, or can we? Um, <clears throat> Madam Vice President, uh, I'll jump in and uh, to the council members questions. I'll say the proposed dispose is my fault. I put the slide together and stuck Ms. Johnson in a difficult uh, position of using a model not of her choosing. Um, Propose is the duty of the mayor in several places in the charter, and I can send that to you offline. It talks about the mayor must present an annual state of the city address. It shall include uh, the mayor's recommendations to deal with the development and needs and health and welfare of the community. It also says under the financial uh, article, Article 9, that the mayor must produce a budget. And as part of that budget, there should be an accompanying message that sets forth the priorities and policies that the mayor has. Um, as part of that spending plan. So the mayor does have a charter imposed duty to propose. Um, that is not to say that council can't propose as well. In fact, uh, only a council member can propose into the legislative process. So the mayor can certainly make a lot of uh, proposals, but ultimately the mayor is going to need to find a partner, an ally in one or more council members so that they can then formally introduce into the council's legislative process um, the form of a local law in the manner of an ordinance or a policy for the enterprise in the manner of a resolution or some other form of action. Um, and then once the council has disposed or voted on that proposal, uh, whether initiated by the mayor or by the council members, it goes to the mayor as an official act of council and the mayor then has to, of course, approve it or to veto it. And in the event of a mayoral veto, of course, it comes back to the council for a second shot. So I, I don't want to uh, create um, undue conflict or uh, not understanding the process, the mayor does have a charter imposed duty to propose policy. That is not to say council members cannot. That is absolutely the centerpiece of why we elect the council is to propose and shape and adopt uh, both local laws and public policies. So I hope I address that. I'm happy to uh, let Ms. Johnston jump in as well um, or to add any further clarification um, that you may need, council member. I think that answers my question, but I was going to see if, if Heather wanted to add anything else. Um, I I think that's pretty much what I would have said as well. I'm sorry, I'm Madam Chair, Councilmember Chug Tai. Um, you know, there is an example, another example of that is the budget document, right? So the budget that the mayor proposes is then um, 
proposed and then the council makes changes and then does the final action. That's kind of the clearest for me, um, probably given my background, um, the clearest example of that, um, but certainly has to work with the council regardless in order to propose something as um, our clerk, uh, Casey Carl just mentioned. So thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and then, you know, I think my next question, um, I I think I, I just don't think I fully processed when you when you talked about this. Um, but one of the pieces I heard earlier is, you know, um, the council structures the administration. And so I, I get, I, can you help me understand that when you say that? Are you just are you addressing that? You know, the council is involved in approving um, department directors, or it, like what exactly does that reference? Madam Vice President and to Council Member Shugtai, actually no, it is a formal power vested in Council. Section 7.2 of the Charter says that the mm -hmm. City Council must establish, organize, and provide for departments by ordinance. So here again, not only does the Charter vest that power to create the executive branch, it says you, you must do it by ordinance. We just got done discussing how the legislative process is dominated by Council. The Mayor can certainly present um, a proposal uh, for an executive branch reorganization plan that would be introduced to council. Council, some member of council would need to take responsibility for that. Um, that plan would be up to the council then to approve uh, in terms of how the government is structured, how functions are allocated amongst its operating departments, um, and, and how those lines of reporting are done. What the council cannot do then is change what the charter has put in place that once you create and structure and assign responsibilities to the executive branch, the manager, the management of that is the responsibility of the mayor. Understood, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Um, you know, I, I, I've heard some kind of back and forth between other council members about this too, but just wanna, um, just want to kind of come back to this conversation we were having earlier about um, concerns that policy is not being implemented and, um, you know, the source of that either being, you know, an unwillingness from the mayor's office to do that, a uh, lack of resources for the, the staff or the department that's, you know, being tasked with the implementation, whatever it might look like. And you know, I, I appreciate that that budget season is is one of our you know tools of accountability. Though I feel I perhaps maybe because I'm I'm new, feel like a, a sense of discomfort around waiting an entire year to 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 use that um, tool. Um, and then you know, I know that something that we're working on is is evaluation via the the auditor's role. And so I wonder where the conversations are around um, just the, the and I know the council vice president addressed this a little bit, but just, you know, the, the, the office of the auditor, for example, being far too small to be able to do that day-to-day -day evaluation work of programs that that council um, has set the direction for and is a part of the law. You know, like I, I'm, I'm trying to understand where that expansion of the auditor's office even is at and where that falls into this, this directive that's in front of us right now. Council Vice President, uh, to Council Member Shugtai's questions, I would take a stab at many of these. I'm going to defer to Ms. Johnston first um, and uh, allow her to speak about from the administration standpoint um, what she believes is the ability of staff to be responsive to council concerns about service delivery, program management within the policy framework of the council. She did touch on this, I think, a little bit when she talked about um, the ability to call, to make inquiries, certainly through your council committee process. That's a, a way of discussing uh, departmental performance. And then to the extent that there's a necessary follow-up, I'm happy to talk more about um, specifics on the audit committee the uh, city auditor and other tools available that I see for the council, um, but but would start with Ms. Johnston. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Chaktai, the, um, I, I think actually, 
our city clerk just answered the question, but I'm going to go ahead and give it my spin here, if you will. Um, I think that we do have a need to develop a more formalized process with respect to reporting measures to the council and our performance against those. Um, this year in the budget, we are anticipating, we've been having departments go through a very detailed process related to measuring their performance against programs. Um, we're hoping to link that more uh, directly to the um, budget process. However, um, I think that we we are also looking at developing a format that kind of I think went to the wayside with COVID um, to do a more formalized reporting on performance against different programs um, on a more regular basis. And so what that might look like, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, um, but there are uh, a couple different things. And so in terms of holding the departments accountable, it, I think during the normal committee process would certainly be um, the most sort of typical way of doing that. However, um, I think also I have had a lot of conversations about performance um, with individual policymakers and certainly uh, does not take waiting to get me in front of a committee for me to try to address those. I will say that um, uh, very directly. So I hope that's responsive to your question. I appreciate that. Um, and then I wonder, um, you know, so, you know, I, I appreciate that this is this that we're what we're looking at today um, is a culmination of conversations that you've had with with department directors, some conversations with the work group, you know, I think uh, and like incredibly thankful that this is again to echo what Council Member Goodman said earlier that this is coming to us. Um, you know, only in our second cycle. Uh, so I can't overstate the thankfulness to, to you for, for working to pull all of that together. You know, I think the place where I get stuck though is um, where the feedback from, from council is included there, right? So, and I think what I mean by that is personally, I would love to not look at, um, I would love to not look at a, a directive or like these the the, the follow-ups to to these pieces that we're 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 giving you, um, or I guess you're giving yourself, um, without having had the chance to provide that same type of input um, moving forward, right? So, you know, like when you you're having those direct conversations with department directors, you're having those direct conversations with the administration. But where do where do we come into that process? You know, even being here today and listening to the other council members ask their questions, express concerns that match up with my own concerns um, and match up with the one-on-one -on -one conversations I've had with my colleagues around the delivery of services to to my constituents. Um, and you know, so I think what I'm really looking for moving forward is the ability to have that same type of input that for example, the mayor's office has, or for example, a, a department director has, and not to have to do that until after those conversations are done, until you've had a chance to process and synthesize and put it in writing and bring it in front of us. So, you know, wanting to see, wanting to really be a part of this process because, you know, we are in the process of creating something new. We are, um, you know, wrestling with, with these big and difficult questions and, um, both in you know individual one-on-one -on -one settings and then as as council in in more public and formalized settings wanting to wrestle with these questions um you know from from the from the start um and and being brought along throughout the entire process so i you know i would just share that feedback you don't necessarily need to react to it but those are my two cents Madam Vice President, I I know that wasn't necessarily framed as a, a comment, but I think as we're all very early in this in this uh, work together, especially with so many new council members, it is good to sort of frame back a little bit. Um, conversations between and amongst department heads about their needs, especially when they have been in the prior administration, this administration are responsible for delivering those services, 
of course, inform our work in terms of what we think would be sustainable and effective in moving a city that is the largest in the state of Minnesota. Um, our conversations, mine at least, that I've been involved with at the council leadership level was simply to say, department heads have been talking about this. Um, we need clarity. There are some specific points uh, on which we need clarity and we need direction. But in recognizing that the council, as I've mentioned several times, works as a body and that no individual council member, even leadership, have individual powers, the manner in which we do engage you begins like this. It begins with a, a structured conversation by staff to the body, whether that body is the full council or here, it's the full, it's the full council, but it's as a committee um, to say, are we on the right track? Give us your feedback in this public setting. Um, we will continue to interact with you on individual basis outside those public forums, but we're always gonna bring stuff back to council in that public setting. So I, I mentioned this a little bit ago that as the clerk that reports to council, my, my next steps with your approval of this directive is to begin that process of engaging each individual council member so that your individual perspectives and voices are included in that work. Um, to be clear in case that it's, it's not, this proposed staff directive was put together by Ms. Johnston and I. It was not informed by the mayor. It was not informed by the council president. It was not informed by the council vice president, except to the extent that those three elected officials told us we concur. We concur that we need clarity. We concur that we need direction. We concur that we need systems that allow us to work together, meaning us, the mayor and council, and then us to work downwards with departments. So outside of that very highest level that there is agreement, um, we then brought this presentation forward, uh, hoping that, and I think we've heard uh, from all of you that have commented that yes, that is important. And now we need to begin the work of engaging each of you individually and then bringing it back to this public forum so that we can close the loop and, and tell departments, this is the direction from the council because that's truly what it will be, the council's direction. So I, I, I did hear you council member. I just wanted to make sure we're very clear on um, the process that we have followed and will continue to follow. I appreciate that, that clarification. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I also just wanna share that that is how Council President Jenkins and I envision this work. Um, that's why we have this as a subcommittee that has all 13 members on it. Um, and, and that was really intentional. Um, we'll also be checking in informally. Um, but I, I do like that we're we're doing this and starting it just even in the second council cycle, starting this conversation up. So thank you. I, I'm not seeing any um, other comments or questions in queue. So um, I think I will, I, I have moved this staff direction. Is there a second on this staff direction as proposed? Second. second. Thank you. I will ask the clerk to please call the roll on that staff direction just to help us move forward with consideration and alacrity. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chuktai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Chavez. Aye. Mayor Palmasano. Aye. Yes and zero nays. Thank you. Next and, and last but not least, we will receive reports from the standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council this Thursday. Just as a reminder, this is a report out. We're not taking actions today. Uh, but it also gives every council member a chance to notify colleagues of any questions or significant issues or motions or amendments they will be bringing forward um, to the full council meeting on the committee's recommendations. So um, we will begin with the Business Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee chaired by Councilmember Goodman. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. The Business Inspections Housing and Zoning Committee is bringing 10 items forward for approval. Item number one are approving appointments to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Item two are the liquor license renewals and three are the gambling license approvals. Item four is a street name change that Council Member Johnson I'm sure will speak to in the council meeting. Item five is a park dedication fee waiver for Worth on the Woods. And item six is a similar one for Nordic House. Item seven is a change in a revenue note for the American Academy of Neurology. Item eight is an agreement with MnDOT and the Downtown Council for a new mural on ramp A. Item nine are reappointments to the Heritage Preservation Commission. And item 10 is a Great Streets Gap Financing Loan at 700 West Broadway. I'm happy to answer any questions on any of the items. Are there any comments or questions on the items? Councilmember Johnson? Maybe he no, just Madam has Chair, his... getting ready for the next report. Ah, there you go. All right, not seeing any. The next committee report is IGR, Intergovernmental Relations Committee, chaired by Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Intergovernmental Relations Committee is bringing forward two items. The uh, first is an amendment to our legislative agenda and policy positions, and the second is an amendment to our state capital uh, investment uh, bill submissions, both to reflect a lowered projected cost for the Nicollet Avenue Bridge. So I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. The next committee is the Policy and Government Oversight Committee, chaired by Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, the Policy and Government Oversight Committee have 19 items uh, to bring to the full council. Uh, item, item one is accepting a city's fortifying democracy creative engagement grant for, grant for promoting youth participation in community issues. Item two is authorizing a request for proposals for squad video systems. Item three is amending the 2022 utility billing rates uh, amendment. Item four is accepting the 2021 quarterly donations report. Item five is authorizing the legal settlement, uh, Lewis Ernest Olson III versus the city of Minneapolis. Item number six is authorizing um, the legal settlement uh, uh, of uh, John Kistler and Oakland Dreams. Um, and item seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, are all uh, workers' comp settlements as well. And item 18 is authorizing, uh, oh, sorry, an, uh, item 18 is also a workers' comp settlement. Um, so sorry, only 18 items, not 19. Uh, we did, however, also have um, a receiving file on some important items regarding redistricting. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to pick that conversation up um, uh, uh, just in a few months here. Uh, and then of course we had our presentations that you were all there for. And uh, I'm hoping that we have some, some urgency and some uh, policy direction that can eventually come out of that discussion. So um, with that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. I am seeing a comment or question from council member Chavez. Yeah, thank you, Chair Palmasano and Councilmember Ellison. Just want to let you all know that I'm going to be pulling 7 through 18 tomorrow at, at our full council in regards to the city employee workers' compensation. I believe it totals $2 million. And either I can ask my questions today or I can ask them at full council, and I'll just be reaching out to city staff if they can give me more information in regards to what, who, which employees these are for compensation and what it is in regards to, I know we had this in Pogo yesterday, but um, it was a longer discussion with other stuff happening. So I just let it go and was just gonna bring this back up uh, at full council and have more discussion there while making some calls today. Councilmember Chavez, I'm, I'm happy to follow up with the staff and you uh, hopefully prior to the meeting uh, at full council um, and get a sense of the questions because it's sensitive material. There are probably things that we'll, are allowed, we're allowed to ask, things that we probably can't discuss in a public forum, but would love to give you as many answers as possible from staff. Uh, and so I'll follow up on that. Thank you so much, Council Member. Thank you and thank you for your leadership, Council Member Ellison. Next, we have the Public Health and Safety Committee, chaired by Council Member Vitoff. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Public Health and Safety Committee has five items that it would like to bring forward uh, this cycle. Item one is authorizing a grant application to FEMA for the staffing for adequate fire and emergency response grant. Item two is accepting a Minnesota Department of Health Nurse Family Partnership Program grant amendment. Item three is accepting the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development grant for corrective healthy home activities. Uh, item four is authorizing a contract amendment for turnout gear. And item five is accepting the Minnesota Department of Health grant for vaccination incentive program. That is Thank it for us. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions or comments in queue on that. So we'll move on to Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, again chaired by Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. The committee is bringing forward six items. The first is uh, very noteworthy. It is the uh, consideration of the mayor's nomination of Margaret Anderson Kelleher to the appointed position of the Director of Public Works. And that is after uh, more than a year without a permanent Director of Public Works. And so the committee is bringing forward that recommendation. Uh, we also are bringing forward a contract with Hennepin County for waste disposal services, a contract with Gray Matter Systems for a SCADA system uh, to support the water treatment and distribution division, an agreement with Excel Energy for electrical feeder replacement, a contract with All Face Construction for additional catch basin and manhole repair, and the project, de project designation, cost estimate, and setting of a public hearing for the Luella Anderson Neighborhood Project Phase Two. With that, I will stand for any questions. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions. Last, we have Audit Committee, and I've asked Councilmember Payne to give the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on Council Committee, this cycle, uh, which was the first of this term, uh, we had four items in new business. Uh, we received a 2022 enterprise risk assessment from our auditor, uh, a report on that, and approved the risk-based integrated audit plan based on that report. Uh, speaking to a couple items or questions that came up during our previous discussion, um, we approved a staff direction directing the city clerk and internal, internal auditor to research and report, report back recommendations around the restructure of the audit committee uh, to be um, completed with enough time so that audit committee can uh, submit those recommendations for city council to approve. Uh, and we reclassified uh, the internal auditor as the city auditor uh, in conjunction with the charter amendment that passed. And we have uh, no items to refer to city council. Thank you. I'm not seeing any questions or comments on the audit committee report. Um, colleagues, please uh, allow me before we conclude with all our matters of business. I do want to end with a very important tidbit about Black History uh, in honor of Black History Month. On this date of February 8th in 1986, during many of our lifetimes, figure skating superstar Deborah Janine Thomas, better known as Debbie, becomes the first black figure, figure skater to win the U.S. Women's Figure Skating National title at just 18 years old. Ms. Thomas would ride this wave of success to the global stage with a gold medal the following month to become the first black skater to win a World Figure Skating Championship. Her illustrious career would later include a runner-up finish and bronze medal at the next two world championships, as well as an Olympic bronze medal at the 1988 Calgary Olympic Games. Following her impressive competitive career, Ms. Thomas would go back to school and finish her medical degree, ultimately becoming an orthopedic surgeon. On this day in the middle of the 2020 to Winter Olympic Games, we remember Dr. Debbie Thomas for her impressive achievements and for being a trailblazer in both the athletic and the medical communities. Thank you for allowing me to look up here on this top screen of mine to read that to you. Um, with that, colleagues, we have concluded all our business to, to come before this committee today. And without objection, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you for your time.